What would you do if your estranged, homeless, alcoholic father suddenly shows up at your door? And what if you knew, in three weeks, you'd be saying goodbye to him forever? Today I'm talking with Kimberly Dewberry, a Texas-based author of the new book, Three Weeks to Forgiveness, who struggled for 25 years to cope with pain, hurt, guilt, regret, unworthiness, and shame brought on by her father's addictions. In this latest book, Three Weeks to Forgiveness, God's Redemption in the Dark Places of Addiction, my guest today, Kimberly, describes life growing up in an alcoholic household, patterns she repeated as a result, and how God doesn't waste one moment of our lives. Do you ever wonder how someone finds their success? or writes that epic memoir, or better yet, solves a problem in their life? I do. Join me this season as we learn vicariously and live better with the Life Lessons Podcast. Kimberly, I'm assuming that when your father walked back into your life, you were not primed and ready and waiting at the door for him to show up. No, I was not. You know, and actually, he... He showed up at my door in an un- unlikely way because my dad, he was actually homeless and living on the streets of Dallas, couch surfing on people's couches that he knew and, you know, whenever he could. We hadn't heard from him in like five years. And we got a call that he was in a local hospital. Hmm. So that is how he came back into our life. He showed up at my door on hospice care. So that's how that all transpired. Not Um, only then are you faced with the emotional return of your father, mm -hmm. all of these things you're going to talk to us about today, but you were faced with caring for him as well. You have a a moral dilemma. You've hurt me all of these years, and now I'm expected to be a part of your life. Yeah, exactly. We we made this decision. I say we, my, my family and I, made this decision to go to the hospital to see him in like hours matter of hours we decided to do that and walking through the door of the hospital and seeing him again after not knowing if he was dead or alive before that moment for how many years was for it? about five years oh. yep about five years we had heard little things from you know different family members that had had sightings of him <laughs> you know but that was it So we made the decision to go, and we walked through the door. He looked nothing like I remembered him looking. And while we were there, in about two or three days' time, we found out that he had inoperable stomach cancer. So that's whenever we were faced with the dilemma, okay, well, who's going to take care of him, you know, during his last unknown amount of time on Earth? We collectively made the decision that our house was the best house for him to to go to to be on hospice care now were you feeling resentment at that time yes <laughs> and did you feel like you were forced into the decision or? uh at first yeah i felt like i was put in a corner we've all decided yeah. <laughs> you're the best one to do this <laughs> yeah well and you know we kind of i mean my sister also debated on taking him into her home but my house was the best because of space uh, i had the most space but it, it was, I had all these mixed emotions just flooding, <laughs> flooding into my heart. And it was, it was just, it was really difficult. Well, you say mixed emotions, but in your book, you also talk about predictable patterns, poor choices, dysfunctional mm-hmm. thinking that all came from living in this alcoholic household yep. as a child. So mm-hmm. I'm thinking that it's not just mixed emotions, but it's a lot of, and I mean no uh, ill will, but mm-hmm. deficits. You know, you're starting oh, with yeah. deficits with a lot of things and having to handle this situation. Yeah. Can you tell me about that? Exactly. What do you mean by predictable patterns? Yeah. My dad started drinking whenever I was about 15, though so I was a, in a... During the formative years, you know, I'm trying to figure out who I am, faced with peer pressures, school, the wanting to be loved by someone and not knowing who exactly, (laughs) you know, that is. And whenever dad started drinking, he would, whenever he was angry with me, if I did something wrong or I rebelled, I had a smart mouth as a 15-year-old, he would retreat into himself so he would shut me out and I would be faced with that silence and I equated that silence with lack of love 
in my in my selfish you know teenage mind I thought okay well he doesn't love me because he's not talking to me he's not interacting with me um, he just wants to go into his room and drink so as a result of that I blamed myself and that's what a lot of adult children of alcoholics tend to do and so that's one of the patterns <laughs> you use an interesting phrase you say lives caged in mm-hmm. guilt and shame depression uh talk to me about what that feels like that cage mm. I, it's, it's an interesting choice of mm-hmm. words well um i you know i imagine that the cage is that depression lack of self-worth that searching for love and I, that emptiness so i had all of those things that uh, I, I felt trapped. I felt trapped within my myself, and so that's what the cage coupled with means a to feeling me. of no way out. I'm yes, sure. no way out. No way yeah, out. So exactly. Cage, you have all mm-hmm. these feelings. You're debilitated on an emotional and physical level, and mm-hmm. then you feel there's no way out. There's, there's no way no, out. No, and there's no place to grab for help. If no. the very adult that's supposed to care for you mm-hmm. and to be the pastor of your home and to be the guiding light as the male role model in your family yeah. is not there. Now, where was mom during this time? Um, oh, she was there. <laughs> she was codependent. She had the codependent tendency. She wanted to help him. Her heart was in the right place, but um, she didn't know. She didn't know how to go about helping. So now, did she enable, as we see a lot of people do, buying the beer, bringing home the cigarettes? No, no, okay. she didn't enable. Um, but she wanted to keep the peace and keep everything at an even level. She wanted to. St- she wanted to make him stop drinking. So. As we foolishly often think we have yes, the power to do. Exactly. Right. As and outsiders. We, yes. And we don't. We do yeah. not have that power. But she thought she did. I mean, and she meant well. Of course. Yeah. Uh, I was the oldest. <laughs> and so I was 15. My sister was five. My mom, my dad would leave inevitably to go buy beer or whatever alcohol of choice it was that day. And she would come get me. We would go and find his hiding places because uh, he hid the alcohol we lived in a house that had a crawl space so that was the number one spot my mom would enlist me to come and help get the alcohol bottles pour it out throw them away what does that feel like for a child i mean Mm -hmm. that's such an adult issue but as an adult what is it that the child feels that they're standing there do you go numb are you just in rope mode or i was actually in the moment i was in i need to complete this mode I've got to do this my mom's asked me to do it so I have to do it afterwards I felt more of that self-blame because I not that my mom ever told me that she was punishing me but I felt like that was a punishment punishment for me like why do I have to do this you know after the fact and she was probably just looking for a compadre yes. in the mess. Someone yeah. to do this messy life with. Yes. Exactly. So adult, you're, you're on the topic already, but you, uh, adult women with alcoholic fathers tend to have this distorted image of mm-hmm. what their blame factor is and how much how much shame they take upon themselves. Mm-hmm. I think that's the whole helpmate thing. And when our helpmate-ness, even with a father or a, a husband, gets distorted. But then you take it even to a different thing. Adult women of alcoholic fathers have a distorted image image of God. So tell me about that. What does that look like for you? Well, for me, I didn't grow up going to church. Okay. Um, So then where did your family get your strength to continue? (laughs) They tried to do it themselves. Mm -hmm. And of course, we know we can't rely on ourselves for our strength. We Uh, know that. (laughs) Yeah, we know that. Some of our listeners may not. So listen up. This would be a good time to (laughs) clue in if you're trying to fix your life on your own. So not growing up in that household with God at the center I knew who God was, but I didn't know and understand the vast power that he has. And so... Nor, I assume, that did you know, have a message of hope? No. And you remember that it could get better? And, no. Or that God could bring relief even if the problem didn't relieve itself? No. I, had, I did not have that. I had this weird correlation between my dad and God. So I related God as a father to what my dad was as a father he was a great father before he started drinking but then after he started drinking it changed and so that silence and that isolation that my dad had I correlated that with God too so if I'm not hearing from God he must not love me 
he must hate me, <laughs> you know. So that that is where, you know, that distorted image comes from because I tried to place my dad on a pedestal with God, and that's not possible. Uh, nobody, nobody can be placed on that that level. And I would assume you probably grow up feeling like God can, will fail you, mm-hmm. that he will even let you down. Yeah. It's, you, it's a crapshoot whether or not he mm-hmm. walks with you, stays with you, and sees you through this life. Right. So on that note, there had to be a turning point. You're obviously not there anymore. And we, uh, I, I don't want to give away the whole story. You do need to buy the book, people. Um, but um, there was a turning point in which you, you're, he's now on your doorstep in hospice. Mm-hmm. And you have to say, I'm going to do this. And I'm going to do this in the Lord's strength. We're mm-hmm. there. But what was the turning point for you? What was the moment that said, I can do this? And did it come in that moment or was it after the three weeks? You know, it, it was a little bit of both. Because I... I was saved whenever I was in my late 20s, but I had turned from walking with the Lord after that. And for about 15 years, I, I didn't walk with the Lord. And then whenever Dad showed up, I think that the Holy Spirit was changing my heart, slowly breaking down those walls and getting me to a broken state so that I can realize that I do need Him. So you could be humbled when someone else who right. is going to walk in in complete humility right. back in your life would be right. ready. So may I ask, did you suffer then from alcoholism or any other addictions yourself mm-hmm. as an adult? Um, I, I did not struggle with addiction. I did drink. Um, I drank socially. Your listeners will, if they get the book, they will mm-hmm. find out some poor choices that I made as a result of doing that. You know, so there even was, the social drinking. Yes, led to even the social choices. drinking. Exactly. But it wasn't even that that woke me up. You know, even some of those poor choices that I had consequences to face as a result didn't wake me up. I mean, it took, it actually took my heart being completely broken. And the humility uh, of my dad actually, for the first time, apologizing to me, making his amends with me. And I say in the book that I imagine, you know, God putting his hand on my shoulder and saying, you can do this, you can forgive him. And I did. That was, I think that was the moment that really started that wall around my heart coming down. So let's talk about that because sometimes we, we have a moment like that and we expect the water just to wash over us. And it does maybe for some, some people have described feeling there was a Uh, like a light switch everything changed in that moment but you're saying that was the moment that the wall started to break down Uh so i'm hearing that maybe it was not a water washing over you forgiveness Uh moment there may have been something more to that yeah can you tell us about that? yeah there was Uh, i'm really stubborn (laughs) and the lord knows that because um that was the first moment but there were there were several other moments leading up to the point of dad's death that really opened my eyes up to the lord's power especially the last three days of dad's life, because it was through those three days that he struggled. There was a spiritual war going on because he was dying during those last three days. The things that I saw and that I write about in Three Weeks of Forgiveness, it was those images of that struggle that I could see with my dad and God. Uh I mean, I could visually see it. I can close my eyes and see it right now. And those that power and dad finally coming to um, you know the Lord's strength during the, that that last day and knowing in that last day that he had made his peace with God too even though he couldn't speak I could see it in his eyes. You understood that. I understood it and I could feel it and you could leave my that room and come back into it and you could feel the presence of the Lord in that room and that was what those are the moments that broke me down and then after dad died of course I was grieving uh, and I was I think I was grieving many things I was grieving the loss of dad but I was also grieving all those years the loss of the life you that never we had. right the loss of those years that we never had together So it was all these different, I mean, just a swimming of emotion that ultimately led to this maze of confusion. I mean, just this, I really felt like I was going in this maze of my life, recounting my own life, 
the choices that I had made over the years, the decisions, uh, the consequences as a result of those, all those patterns and, and just everything. And I felt like there was no way out. You still know, caged. I still, I still feel like, I, yeah, I'm, I'm caged in all of this. And that was also what, what woke me up to the fact that my husband was also an alcoholic. Okay. And I was a codependent and I was the enabler. Um, so there, there's so the cycle those, it, it just continued on, and I did not, I didn't, I was blind to it, and I think I was deliberately blind to it because I had been married already twice before, mm-hmm. and those marriages were very volatile and you know filled with alcohol and you know all these different things on my part too, and then. With my third husband, I did not, I could not stand the, the thought of being a divorced person for the third time. I, you know, I think that it was through this event that God not only was breaking down my walls, but peeling back the layers from my eyes and saying, look, look in front of you. Wake up. <laughs> you see what's, yeah. yeah. See what's right in front of you. That was what started the healing between uh, my husband and myself as well. It's interesting that we talked about mourning the, the life you didn't have. Mm-hmm. A lot of people choose not to mourn the life that they could have had because they feel guilty for thinking about that. Mm-hmm. They feel shameful. They feel they stuff it down, and then that actually leads to anxiety and deeper depression later. So for those of you who are listening that this is touching a heartstone for you, you need to realize that you need to mourn the life that you didn't have, the dreams you might have had as a little girl, a little boy, thinking that life should have been different. You're right, it should have. That is a very accurate statement. And um, you need to mourn death. You need to mourn other things. But it's okay to think upon the things in your life that you thought would be different to tell yourself that story and then to face the the alternate reality that could have been and then you put that to bed but a lot of people stifle those feelings so mm-hmm. it's, it's good that you did that and I'm so thankful that you did because that's how God really helps us mm-hmm. to work you talk about resting in God's love because you felt unworthy of love can you explain what you mean about feeling unworthy of love I'm thinking there's a tie-in there with three marriages and mm-hmm. marrying men who obviously had issues of addiction well that unworthy of love um i guess started with my dad with his silence and because i equated that silence with not being worthy of anyone's love it's how a teenage mind tends to work but you know through the feelings and the emotions that go along with a marriage period you know just an everyday marriage but you throw in all these things that are so similar to how i grew up yet I I felt like I couldn't get out of those either. And so when I finally did, I just fell right back into another. (laughs) And so it was almost like a magnet for me. Same problems, different skin. You know, whenever I married Patrick, my my husband now, I still felt like I wasn't worthy of his love. And so I think that's the reason why I, I tried so hard to hold on to him no matter what the cost was. I, that's the reason why I went and bought his beer for him because I thought if I bought it, I could control how much he was drinking, which does not work. You thought you could be the pacer card? Exactly. Yeah. That was the reason why I drank with him because I thought if I stop, then he'll stop. That doesn't work either. <laughs> I mean, just all these different things because I thought, well, if I make him stop drinking, then he's not going to love me anymore. I couldn't stand that that thought because I had already felt that way my whole life. You'd already suffered the feelings exactly. of unloved. Exactly. So, you know, whenever God started peeling back the uh, layers of my eyes that were blinding me, I resisted because I'm stubborn. I resisted, you know, that and God st- still kept pursuing me and tugging at my heart and saying, you really need to look at this, you know. Yeah. As a matter of fact, it went so far it went so far as the Lord telling me, you know, he needs to leave for a little bit. And that scared me to death, you know. That really scared me because I thought, 
I can't, I can't do this. But that's the ultimate silence for someone who is exactly. so afraid not to be, when you equivalent communication with mm-hmm. you from another person to love, but then right. when them going away, mm-hmm. that would be. For those of you listening in right now, uh, she said God pursuing her, and that's exactly what God does. He pursues you. He comes after you. He can constantly tugs at your heartstrings, shows you that he's there over and over again, and, and most of the time, it's hindsight being 2020. We mm-hmm. look back and say, oh my gosh, you saved me from so many things. You kept me safe, and you can see God pursuing you. Mm-hmm. What I would love for people to do is start to uh, open their eyes and be alert and aware to where God maybe be pursuing them right now in their situation because that's really where you see him at work and you don't have to wait till the problem is resolved you can open your eyes right now and say God make it as clear as a bell to a two year old so that my feeble mind can understand it and I can see it through all my chaos and all my stress and all my emotions and all my unworthiness all the words you've used Mm -hmm. but you can start to sense it so he can peel back those layers because he will do it right now right here Mm -hmm. in working with people and helping yourself you get to personal recovery you're a big promoter of recovery programs and why is that so if someone out here is listening and saying okay I am seeing my life mirrored in Kimberly's life why is it recovery programs why not go it alone why not just do it with the family you can't do it alone so what happens in a recovery program that's so different from reading a book or a Mm self-help book it's community in that community you are able to hear other people and even though their stories that that they share may not be exactly like yours they're relatable stories because you can you can hear what they have to say and you can you can finally say I'm not alone I'm not by myself there's somebody else that feels like I feel and I mean it, it goes on and on I mean it's not just one person your group may only have five people in it it may have 25 but there is always going to be always going to be somebody in that group that you can either benefit from a story that they tell or you can relate to them I call that shared strength. Yes. And that happens when we have a shared experience with people. God is so good. He created our brains to dump all these amazing chemicals into it, feel good things. It's shared strength. You really can tap into the power of someone else's story and ride that on an emotional level and on a physical level. You can actually carry that with you. And I'm I'm going to take it a step further than that, too, because the Lord says that where two or more gather, I am there also. Mm -hmm. And he's there. (laughs) I mean, he's there, um, you know, guiding you through it. He's there to help you walk through the door for the first time. Um, You know, if you're not sure if recovery is for you, (laughs) just go to one. Just go to one recovery meeting. And it will change your view. Because walking through that door of a recovery program for the first time was the scariest moment of my life. One of them. (laughs) I've had a few. But... Uh, one of them and I didn't talk the first time I went I just sat and listened and that was what changed my view uh, on recovery because so many people equate recovery with the addict but we have things that we need to recover from also and it's through that community that that's able to start happen and God's able to start moving in in those areas as well absolutely and so you are a busy blogger. You have your blog, Transforming Normal. Mm-hmm. You work in churches, recovery programs. You own your own business, and then you stop to write Three Weeks to Forgiveness. So what compelled you to do that? What what message, what purpose, what big vision did God give you with this book that you know that people who pick it up get a copy from mm-hmm. Amazon <laughs> or from my website? It'll be listed there shortly after this uh, airs. What was the purpose? Obedience. Dad died in in August of 2015, and um, I rededicated my life to Christ in October of 2015, and then in January of 2016, I woke up from a dead sleep. I had this overwhelming feeling that was just, write the book. That was it. You know, three words, write the book. I didn't really know what that meant in that moment, but I knew that that was from God. I knew the Holy Spirit was telling me that I needed to do this, but I didn't know what. I journal, and through my journals, uh, that was where it came out, you know, and was revealed to me, this is what I need to write about. I need to write about this moment. This because journey. Right, because this, this journey 
is the one that God's had me on as practice. All of the things that has happened that I write about in Three Weeks to Forgiveness, all of that uh, was practice for me to be able to help others that feel like I feel or have felt like I have felt or have been through the things that I've been through or similar. So this is a great book not only for yourself, but if you feel like there's someone in your life that's suffering that maybe isn't seen clearly or isn't willing to face some of the ugly mirror mirror on the wall truth this mm-hmm. is a great book to put in their hands as a tool coupled with recovery yes. possibly with one-on-one therapy if they need that mm-hmm. extra push or they're maybe even too afraid to go into a group setting that they might see a therapist first and a good therapist will always lead them to a group recovery yes. so remember that if you go to see a therapist that's um, how i started recovery oh you yeah, the therapist good <laughs> yeah so you tell us You're quoted in the book by saying, miracles actually do happen. I've seen it and I've lived it. Mm -hmm. So tell us about that and then tell us how can others find hope in that statement? Mm -hmm. How can they find their miracles? Mm -hmm. Miracles are really in front of us every day. We just have to be open to them. But uh, I've seen so many miracles in my life. But really what I meant by that statement is God bringing dad back into our life so that for many different reasons. I mean, it's not just one central reason that he did that. I believe that he did it so that dad wouldn't have to die on the street uh, or on a couch of a stranger. I believe that he did it so that we would have that closure, that time together, so we could mend our relationship. Many other relationships that were broken were mended as a result. And most importantly, My relationship with God, my husband's relationship with God, my mother's relationship with God. I mean, there's just all these different... It's like a a domino effect. And that domino effect is, is the miracle. Because before, we were all total opposite estranged separated angry bitter Mm -hmm. i'm sure yes so that that is the message of hope that you Mm -hmm. didn't get as a child right that god delivered in mass not just one relationship fix but Mm -hmm. everything everything looks brighter lighter better well and and who knows how many more are being affected that i can't see or you know or other people you know can't visibly see right now you know how many people are being brought back to God, you know, as a result of that. I mean, starting their own journey. Right, starting their the own journey. Uh-huh. Exactly. Starting their own journey to healing and to hope and finding that you, know, you may never hear from them. You right. may hear from a handful that decide to write or do a review and, right. and reach out to you. But how many people will pick up this book at a random place? And that's why I encourage everyone to get a copy. Read it and then leave it. Read it mm-hmm. and leave it somewhere because you <laughs> yep. never know the power of the word. Not mm-hmm. only God's word, but word in general. It's yes. where people have stories and people need to hear other people's stories so they can feel empowered to pick up the pieces and know that they there is someone who loved them so much. Mm-hmm. He created them. He came down from heaven for them. He walked mm-hmm. with them. They felt these same problems. And then he lives in us once we accept that wonderful gift. So tell me what life would have looked like had you not had this experience. Where would you be today had you not found Christ, recovery, redemption? I, I mean, I don't know. I would probably be divorced again. <laughs> um I would probably still not be walking with the Lord like I should be. Uh, I would be miserable. I would be horribly depressed because that's where I was. You know, those are the places I I was in. And, you know, I I, I isolated myself. And, you know, that's where Satan wants to to stay. He wants us to stay in isolation because that's where he can um, attack us. Uh, and use our past against us. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, there was a spiritual warfare going on inside of me too. I just wasn't keenly aware of it. As a result of number one, having Christ. Uh, number two, being in recovery. And number three, having a relationship with Christ. Not really just having Christ in my life, but having a relationship. I'm able to spot those patterns a lot faster and squelch them I'm also able to see or feel when Satan's attacking me and combat it with the armor so you know where would I be well I wouldn't be here (laughs) and Uh, I would be sad (laughs) yeah I mean it would just 
I just don't, I wouldn't be where I need to be. You know, I wouldn't be in the arms of Christ. It's, um, I want to really rest in that thought for just a moment that she brought up right now, folks. And it's that, that awareness of the red flags of Satan. And that comes from that relationship that she's talking about. And that's not a one-sided relationship. When you reach out to the Lord, he, he reaches out to, and he actually comes more than halfway. The Bible actually tells us you take one step, he comes more than halfway. He is running towards you. And then this remarkable thing happens. He actually gives you wisdom and discernment to make sense of your life and to know, oh my gosh, I'm seeing a pattern. I'm seeing this again. I'm seeing myself slipping. I'm seeing, or I've been here, I've done this, but now I've got tools. Uh And then he puts people in your life who walk alongside you that you can lean upon. You have that shared strength. You do life with, you experience um, pains and, and growth and you work things through. So you're constantly growing stronger and stronger. That is the idea of relationship. They, it says in the Bible, even the demons know there's a God. You know, there's a lot of people can recognize a higher power. And even some recovery programs will say the recognition of a higher power. But it is the relationship with Christ Jesus. It's reaching out to him and saying, I don't get it. I don't know how this works. This feels completely awkward. I don't even know what words to say to you. I speak to Jesus as if he's a friend. He is an omnipotent, um, omnipresent God that I revere. But I also reach out to him in, in simple conversation. God, I'm hurting. I don't know what to do. I don't know what to go. And I sometimes just hit my knees. Sometimes I just cry. Sometimes I'm just in this hurtful moment where I'm, I'm going to my friend Jesus, my best friend Jesus, help me, help me, help me. And out of that comes all of these tools that seem to sweep in right at the right moment. This discernment of, okay, don't go there. Or this wisdom to, you're doing this again. It's those kind of things that happen. So when she says relationship really reach into what that might mean for you and it's not just an acknowledgement of god anybody can acknowledge god it's it's taking a chance on having him or knowing him as your friend Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so this show is called life lessons and it's entitled life lessons because uh, my tagline is learn vicariously so you can live better so what is your toolbox life lesson that you want to leave with our listeners today and of course all those more life lessons come in the book so pick up the book it once again is three weeks to forgiveness god's redemption in the dark places of addiction from kimberly dewberry and that's d-e-w-b-e-r-r-y you can find her on Amazon, the higherhopescounseling.com website, or the erinkincaid.com website, and find a link to today's show and directly to her link on Amazon if you don't want to have to find it yourself. <laughs> if you don't want to have to type in the words, um, that'll be there for you. But what's your life lesson that you want to leave them with today? You're not alone. So don't do it alone. Seek help from someone. I went to a counselor first, a Christian counselor. And then that, that counselor then uh, led me to a recovery. So either go to recovery or go to a counselor, a good Christian counselor, uh, because they will speak that wisdom into your, into your life and into your chaos and start talking to God. I mean, those, I know that's three things. You said one, but <laughs> yeah, yeah the, those three things. I mean, God saved me. The counselor um, helps me, and the recovery sustains me. So those thi- those three things, well, God sustains me too, but th- it's the recovery, you know, that that all, it's, it's all intermixed, <laughs> you know, together. But, don't, you know, you're not alone, so. You're not alone, so don't no, do it alone. don't do it alone. Don't be foolish and try this on yeah. your own. Do not try at home alone. <laughs> Thank you so much for being on the show today. I have enjoyed this. This has been great. I know several people in recovery, people trying to get into recovery themselves, making that that huge decision to turn their lives around. I know it's going to help many, and I'm very excited to be able to put this show out and let people hear what blessings you have for them. Thank you, Erin. It's been a pleasure. And uh, what's your website? Oh, uh, www.kimberlydewberry.com. That will take you to wherever you want to go. It'll also take you to the book. The book and the blog Mm -hmm. and all other activities that you have going on. All that stuff. And recovery resources as well. Yes, recovery resources. Yes. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. You've been listening to Life Lessons with Erin Kincaid. Make it a good one and choose.